All right. Hi, people. And welcome to the workshop on quantum systems and computation. I'm Rod Van Meter from Keio University, and I guess I'm going to be giving you a, a keynote speech here remotely today. Um, let me share my screen, my uh, slides, and we'll go. All right. My title for today is Quantum Airliners: Whole Stack Quantum Computer Development. And I want to talk to you about how we're going to get from where we are today with working functional quantum computers and how we're going to get to the large scale computer systems that we really ultimately need. So my name is Rod Van Meter. I'm a professor at uh, Keio University in the Faculty of Environment and Information Studies uh, in Japan. And I'm sorry I couldn't be with you there in uh, Florida day, today. I really wanted to go to FCRC this year. I haven't been in quite a while. Uh, but I also have to be in Europe next week, and I couldn't manage to do both trips back to back. So sorry I'm with you remotely, but I'm looking forward to talking to all of you all face to face uh, sometime. So I assume most of you recognize this photo. This background photo here, this is the Wright brothers first flight in 1903, right? The first uh, human powered flight. Well, the Wright brothers did a bunch of amazing things. They designed their own airfoil. That means you know, the shape of the wing, uh, the, the cross section of the wing. They actually went and got data from a journal, wrote away for it via mail and got the data back and assumed that design was good and then used it for a while, but then discovered that the data really wasn't accurate. And so they wound up having to create wind tunnels to actually test their own airfoil designs and they created their own. They also had to design their own propellers uh, in a similar fashion. But And they ultimately designed and built their own gasoline engine, which, if memory serves, is uh, six horsepower. But probably their biggest overall contribution was actually 3D aeronautical control. Um, prior to the Wright brothers, most people who were innovators in flight thought that the way you were going to fly would be essentially to do ice skating in the air, where you just turn the rudder and it will cause the plane to turn and move left or right. And that up and down were entirely separate things. But the Wright brothers recognized from their studies from of birds and and uh, kites that instead, 3D um, aeronautical control is really a 3D problem and it involves the shape of the wings. And so they learned to to camber their wings and change the shape. Um, and they recognized that when you do that, that you lose lift, and so you have to add power to to the system as you go. So they really turned it from a 2D problem into a 3D problem. So fantastic innovations, and they did this all themselves, which is astounding. Right? Well, you know, a little bit of help with a couple of uh, people in their workshop, but you know, they were they were the real drivers of it. Um, they were also, by modern standards. Um, advocates of closed source, and they were big defenders of patents. They actually kept a lot of their work secret while, while they were patenting it. Whereas their rival, Sam, Samuel Langley, who was the, uh, the head of the Smithsonian Institution at the time, um, was what we would now call an open source or an open science advocate. And um, you know, he shared all sorts of information with the Wright brothers, and he wanted them to in turn to share theirs with him, but they didn't. Instead, they were very secretive about it. And um, ultimately, they were the first to create the heavier than air powered flying craft. But because of their work, they essentially impeded the development of aviation in the United States for a couple of decades. And the, the center of it essentially moved to uh, Britain and uh, Europe um, for a couple of decades. So um, there's a lesson there. Compare that to today's airliner. Right? This is a picture I picked up off of the web. Look at the range of places these subcomponents uh, come from, or these subsystems come from. You got the center wing box from Fuji in Japan, the wing from Mitsubishi in Japan, um, the uh, the leading and trailing edges of it uh, built in Oklahoma and Australia uh, and Japan, and um, the forward fuselage was built in Kansas, and the tails built in Washington, where Boeing where originally had their headquarters. The engines come from either GE in uh, Ohio or from Rolls-Royce in in, uh, in the UK. Um, it, cargo access doors come from Sweden. It comes from everywhere, right? This is what it takes to build a complete world-class modern airliner today. Compare that to what the White Brothers did uh, essentially working on their own. And so the question for us is how do we get from 
these small hand-built custom quantum computers that we have today to something that's the equivalent of one of these airliners. So um, as I said, I'm Rod Van Meter. Um, I'm vice center chair for the KO Quantum Computing Center and have some other titles. I'm involved in various and sundry things. But the most important part of this is the long list of uh, collaborators uh, that I've put on the slide here, as well as funding agencies. And I've probably forgotten some of both uh, because we've worked with a lot of people on this because it takes a lot of people to build a, a large scale system. And ultimately I am an advocate for open source and open science as we go, even today, even as the, the, uh, the community is getting substantially more competitive. Right. So this is actually my group um, in fall of 2023. Actually, this is only about two thirds of us. There were about eight or 10 people who were missing that day. Um, we come from more than 10 different countries and speak more than a dozen different languages. And we're working on every aspect of quantum computing that, that we can think of that's relevant to actually expanding the scale of these systems. So if you're interested, you know, come join us. Um, we work primarily in English, but with a lot of uh, Japanese thrown in and then, you know, the occasional bits of Chinese and French and Thai and uh, all the other languages that, that uh, the group uh, speaks. So my work really falls into uh, what I think of as four major areas. Quantum computation, quantum com uh, communication, education, and community. And we'll really sort of lump those last two together. And we've got a number of projects that are going on in those areas I want to tell you about. But ultimately, all of this leads to what I call the third information paradigm. Um, analog systems, that includes, you know, obviously, like uh, vinyl record recordings and the old wax cylinders for, for sound and film, as in photography and movies. Um, great mechanisms for recording data in single generations, but they tend to lose fidelity as they as copies get made, and they're actually hard uh, formats to actually process data on. Um, you could put you know things like the printing press and things like that, and publish books into this area of analog information if you want. Even though those aren't truly analog, they also retain that difficulty of uh, being something that's you know, difficult to actually uh, process in any sort of automated fashion. Then the second generation is really um, digital computation. It was zeros and ones, what we're used to. And that doesn't just have to be you know, TTL or CMOS or even um, uh, Josephson Junction or optical or whatever. It could be almost any sort of medium. But that leads us to the third generation of uh, information, the third information paradigm, and that's quantum. And you know, everybody in this room is probably as familiar with the general ideas of quantum as I am. Uh, we're dealing with complex ampl amplitudes that lead to superposition and entanglement as the key um, methods for actually driving the execution of large-scale quantum computations. So let me talk about these areas of our work and um, note that our work on quantum computer architecture or system architecture really spans both the computation and the communication areas. Um, I define the word architecture, right? So here's the, the, the definition from actually the, uh, the Apple dictionary. Um, architecture is the art or practice of designing and constructing buildings or the style in which it's designed and built or the complex or carefully designed structure of something like uh, the logical organization of a computer. Well, so you might be thinking in terms of components like these, like staircases and columns and windows as being subsystems or components of a, of a larger system that leads you ultimately to the development of a cathedral, you know, something like this. Right? That's architecture. What we're doing is also architecture. My definition of architecture actually runs something like this. There are actually two ways to use the word architecture. You can use it as a noun or you can use it as a verb. Um, the noun is the set of blocks or subsystems and their separate roles and interfaces and their overall arrangement that define a system. Okay. To architect as a verb means within a set of environmental constraints using a set of these building blocks design a system that satisfies a need, hopefully elegantly and, uh, and economically. 
right? So how does that all fit into the, into the quantum computing world? Well, we've been drawing pictures like this since at least 2006. This is from my own PhD thesis back then, where we have things like um, quantum computational complexity at the top and small scale qubit storage and, and uh, gate uh, technologies at the bottom. And in between, there's this area of what we can call quantum computer architecture, which is figuring out how to map the, the algorithms that the theorists define into systems that the, that the, uh, the hardware guys can build. And that involves not, o not only that software process, but also the process of guiding the development of the, uh, the hardware as we go. So this is more or less a roadmap to where we want to be, okay? Um, in the bottom left, there are early qubits. Um, and obviously where we want to get to is we want to get to having a lot of qubits. So we want to move to the, to the right on this, more, more application qubits. Um, but we also want to get to higher fidelity. So we want to move from the lower left corner to the upper right corner. And where we are today is essentially NISC there in the uh, toward the lower left corner. Although we're getting toward, we're designing and building systems that are less noisy ISC and um, nisc -er, again, where uh, you know, NISC is noisy intermediate scale quantum systems. Um, and we're getting just now essentially to the first fault de tolerant demonstrations, which dramatically reduces the number of qubits that are available to an application that's actually going to run on it, but ideally will give us those improvements in fidelity that we're ultimately going to need. And part of how we get there is we go up that vertical left edge of the figure toward longer code distances, um, and you want to push right toward just adding more qubits in, in the overall system. And at some point in the top middle, you'll get to what I call uh, max SQ, the max single uh, the 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 maximum single chip fault tolerant system. Um, surprisingly, you know, people who are not really uh, not really focusing on the quantum hardware, qubits are big. We're used to thinking of atoms and photons and electrons as being these tiny things, but it turns out that the structures that we need to to build and control um, quantum computers actually turn out to be enormous relative to the standards of um, transistors. They might be, for example, 50 microns on a side um, the, uh, for, for some of these structures, which is essentially big enough to see, okay? Um, whereas transistors are below, well below 50 nanometers on a side. And so we can be talking about something that's um, a thousand times less dense in both the horizontal and vertical uh, dimensions uh, and the X and Y dimensions, north and south, uh, north, south, and east, west, if you prefer. And so we can be talking about a million times less um, density of qubits relative to transistors on a machine. So that size of the largest system that we can fit onto a single chip, particularly when we're talking about fault tolerance, is going to be pretty limited. And let's call it max Q. So at some point, what we have to do is we have to go from single chip systems to multi-chip systems, and that's going to involve designing and building interconnects. Now, you can argue that the ion traps that, that have been demonstrated uh, um, to create entanglement between two remote ion traps, um, those are already doing a form of distributed computation. Um, Recent work from groups like the, the group of Andreas Walraff have, have demonstrated that it's even possible to take superconducting systems and cool a connection between them low enough such that you can actually um, do microwave level connections between them. But most of the other work has been shift pushing toward uh, optical interconnects between systems. So those are the kinds of systems that I call multi-computers. And the word multi-computer goes back uh, at least to the early 1980s. Um, Chuck Seitz, who was a professor at Caltech and coincidentally my undergraduate advisor, although I didn't have anything to do with his research group, really pushed the term for uh, multi-computers for essentially what we would call today supercomputer large-scale distributed uh, systems where you have a node with a processor and a certain amount of memory, and then you replicate that and you have a whole bunch, whole bunch of them connected via an interconnect system. That's a multi-computer. So we can say that NISC multi-computers exist today, and we can say that 
NISC intermediate scale computers exist today. And the first follow tolerant demo demonstrations are starting to develop. And so the question is, how do we get to that fault tolerant quantum computer that's in the pink bubble in the upper right up there? Um, so you could say we are today at the Wright brothers level with real functioning quantum computers, but they're essentially hand-built by small numbers of people. Um, I mean, I know the team at IBM is big, the team at Google is big, the startup companies uh, who are like uh, IonQ and Rigetti and, and others, they're, they're adding headcount rapidly because it's not something that can be done by two or three people. But still, ultimately, it's far smaller than the number of people it takes to build a, an airliner, like in the, in the upper right corner. And so the question is, how do we get there? So this is a slightly more technical diagram of a, uh, a large scale system. We're in the process of contributing to the design to um, the upper row of gray boxes is the classical control for the individual nodes. The, uh, the lower row there is our quantum compute nodes in blue and maybe a quantum storage node in uh, pink and a QRAM node with, uh, with a high volume data there in purple. Um, and the, the scale of this will demand that there will be distributed control as well, which is why each of the nodes is shown with, with a separate controller rather than all being controlled via one centralized system. Ultimately, there this will evolve over, over a series of stages, but ultimately we will get to the point where we have a quantum system area network that allows us to create um, homogeneous or create fault tolerant entanglement between pairs of nodes. And in some cases that might be homogeneous entanglement between two nodes that are running the same physical technology and or the same logical technology, including the error correction code that's in green there on the left. And maybe in the, uh, on the right there uh, or in the middle, the pink, we might actually be creating entanglement between nodes that have very different um, characteristics in terms of either hardware or the, uh, the, error correcting code that they're actually in use. And uh, then ultimately in the upper right there, you know, this whole system may connect outside to, to somewhere outside via a quantum network to other machines and sensors and, and ultimately to a quantum internet as we go. So when you're gonna build a system like this, there's a lot of stuff you're gonna need, right? Um, this is a partial list. Somewhere on this entire page, it says quantum chips, right? And yeah, maybe that's the single most important part of the whole system, but you can't build a system without it. You can't build the system without the classical control. You can't build it without a dilution refrigerator. You can't build it without PCBs that work at low, uh, low temperatures, coaxial cables that work at low temperatures, um, the analog filters for your signals, um, you know, the 19-inch racks that you're going to put all of this in, um, sufficiently stable power supplies. It takes an industry to build this. Right? Now, this is what you call... Uh, anyone who's worked in a company that actually manufactures projects will recognize as the, uh, this is the bomb. This is the bill of materials. This is the set of things you're going to have to put into a system. And so you'll hear people who work for, for manufacturers talking about bomb cost a lot. Well, this is the bomb that goes with the bomb cost. But it's not just hardware. We also have ultimately a need for a software bomb, a software bill of materials, a whole set of things that are going to be needed to build these large scale uh, computers. And so um, this is a partial list, compilers and software libraries and noise mitigation and debuggers and, and all of these sorts of things. And each one of these items here is not just one single tool or application or one single problem that has to be solved. But inside of this, there's a whole set of sub problems that, that, that um, people have to work on. And we ultimately have to, to uh, build end -to -end systems that function end to end for this. So let me divide these into um, a set of things um, or a set of groups here, right? Roughly, we can say that these compilers and software libraries highlighted in red there at the top are what application programmers use for writing the application. They're meaning your quantum kernel, the, the, the kernel of your uh, computation in the quantum system there, and the supporting classical code. Um, the yellow part is for writing the experiment that runs the application. 
And the green part is for running the experiment. Now, the green part's mostly going to be vendor-owned. That's mostly going to be designed and built and maintained uh, by uh, IBM or IonQ or, or uh, Quantinium or whoever, right? Um, simulators, they're both proprietary and, and open ones. And then in purple, we have source code control and debuggers and software and quality assurance tools and things like that. All of that stuff in purple is what we can consider to be the future of quantum software engineering. And I think one of the key questions right now for the for the community as a whole is how much we can leverage existing software development tools and practices. All right, now I called this an experiment. You might be thinking of a quantum algorithm, but why did I call it an experiment? Well, um, the gentleman sitting there next to me is Professor Dave Farber, who is the head of KO University's Cyber Civilization Research Center and the uh, sometimes called the grandfather of the internet because he was PhD advisor to some of the people who did um, some of the early ARPANET development in the 1960s. Uh, go look him up if you're interested. Um, I showed Dave some Kiskit code, uh, oh, a few years ago now, uh, complete with the job management where you know, the code that ships it to IBM and gets the results back and then all it does all of the data post-processing and everything. He responded sort of roughly, um, this isn't an application, it's an experiment. So how do we get to from quantum experiments to quantum applications that ordinary everyday users can, can actually uh, use and that ordinary everyday application programmers can contribute to? Well, um, you know, one thing I'd like to point out, by the way, is that um, None of this is possible without theory. So we should also be aware that theory comes in many flavors from people who are working on you know, the information in black holes and, and uh, um, the relationship of quantum gravity to, to various things, to um, you know, the design of individual devices like a single qubit or a single um, coupler or, or things like that. Uh, but it also includes computational complexity and the development of new algorithms and all sorts of things. And so there's an entire community built around that, which to an even larger extent than the hardware uh, and the software actually probably is, is centered around uh, um, a set of journals. And here are just a few of the journals that are out there uh, right now um, that specialize in, in our area of trying to build and deploy and use and maintain large-scale quantum computers. Um, and in the upper left there, uh, by the way, that's the IEEE Transactions on Quantum Engineering. And I am currently editor-in-chief of that journal, and I would love to have your work submitted to, to the journal. Um, of course, it will have to go through peer review, so no promises is going to be accepted, but please submit to the journal. We also have uh, to work on in order to have a complete system, a complete, well, not system, but ecosystem, we also have to have education and community. And these are just some of the things that, that my group and I have been involved in over the last many years in dealing with us. Um, on the bottom right, for example, you'll see a, uh, a photo from, from a, uh, a hackathon a weekend hackathon that was a multi-day hackathon that was supported by IBM for Kiskit. Um, that group of uh, young people there won an award for their for their uh, for their uh, project, and two of those five were actually students of mine. Sarah there on the left, and uh, and uh, Nishio to the right of the guy holding the uh, the cue. So that's one way to get young people involved and to accelerate uh, the uh, the overall involvement in the the field and. Um, you know, I very strongly believe that letting the actual students use real-world quantum computers increases both the the uh, the attractiveness and fun of what we're doing, the rate of learning and the rate of retention, both of their learning and of people in the field. So I think it's absolutely critical to put the machines in the hands of the young people. Um, in the upper right is an online course we created about seven years ago now, I think called uh, Understanding Quantum Computers, which uh, last I checked was free and is freely available on uh, an open um, platform called um, FutureLearn. So uh, 
most of you in the room are probably specialists on quantum computing, so there won't be anything new new in, in it for you. But when you have beginning students or families or friends who are interested in it, by all means, you share this, uh, this uh, course with them. It's about 20 hours worth of work, and they'll learn a lot from it. Uh, in the top in the middle is a book. I am a tremendous advocate of books, including textbooks. Sadly, I do not own the, the, uh, the copyright on that one. I signed the copyright of it away, but we have another one in process that, that will cover a lot of the same ground. I'll tell you a little bit more uh, about in a minute. And it's based on the course in the lower left there, known as Overview of Quantum Communications. And that we're building uh, as part of a, a Japanese government-funded push to create enough courses for a complete online under or a, a complete undergraduate curriculum in uh, in quantum and so universities will take these modules and use them as build uh, in the process of building a quantum curriculum uh, that's our expectation and so we are doing um within that group which is covering everything from information theory to algorithms to architecture our responsibility is uh, communications and so we've already put our first uh, two modules uh, online and shortly the third one will be uh, online um, and you are welcome to uh, use the materials. We are making the materials available, uh, Creative Commons. So um, one of the things that I think we really need to talk about, again, I'm talking about community and talking about connections between people. We created several years ago at KO University, the KO Quantum Computing Center, the KQCC, we call it. And um, this is a group photo from a review session we held in February of 2019. Um, KQCC was created to house our relationship with uh, IBM, which gives us uh, access to IBM's leading edge machines. IBM researchers work with us at KQCC. They're stationed, stationed at one of, one of the KO campuses and are there uh, on a regular basis. And we have member companies who've come and joined us with, uh, with us. There were four initially. We're now up to uh, eight. Um, you can see them listed there. And the way this works is KO and IBM bring the quantum expertise and then the member companies uh, you can think of them as our problem partners. What they bring is they bring the problem domain expertise. So you combine the problem expertise with the people who understand the, quant the, the quantum and ideally tremendous learning and development uh, actually occurs. And I think we're doing actually pretty well on that front. Um, standing to uh, in the left, uh, to the left of me in this figure is uh, Naoki Yamamoto, who's the, uh, the, uh, the head of the group. Um, Kohei Ito was not president that day. Kohei Ito, uh, some of you may be familiar with, um, has been in quantum computing for a long time, and he was my PhD advisor, and he's now the president of KO University, making uh, KO, I believe, the first major research university anywhere in the world with a quantum computing person as president. So, returning to the question, um, what's an architecture? Well, this diagram is, um, it's not really an architecture diagram, but it's really sort of a, a set of, you know, almost subfields um, that different individuals can work on and different um, organizations and journals and ideas interface with this overall picture in different ways. Uh, by the way, I completely left out uh, programming languages on this stack, and I don't know why, because I'm actually, I've done programming development uh, over the course of my career, and it's just an oversight. All right, so um, I've got maybe another 10 or 15 minutes here to uh, to talk to you. Let's see. And we're back to our four themes. I want to introduce to you very briefly some of, some of the things that we've been working on now that I've given you a little bit about philosophy and where I think we are and where we think we're going. So first up, um, this is a rough outline of some of the projects that are actually going on in, uh, in my group, let alone in the KO Quantum Computing Center at large. We're working on quantum error correction and quite a bit on the quantum internet, but also uh, tools such as compilers and debuggers and error mitigation and um, algorithms and communication, you know, uh, um, popular uh, communication with the public and uh, all sorts of different things going on. And of course, they are funded by a number of different organizations, many of them within the, uh, the uh, Japanese government. All right, so computation, let me tell you very quickly, um, that's 
the machine in uh, Kawasaki. Um, an IBM uh, Falcon processor, 27 qubits. It's uh, not far from one of our laboratories. Um, but using machines like that, one of the things uh, that, that we've been concerned about since, since for several years, since we first got access to the machines, is how to um, track cumulative data in an application, um, given that doing digital arithmetic uh, involving a lot of CNOTs and a lot of TOEFL gates is actually hard uh, on today's systems. A um, couple of our people, um, Takahiko Sato, who is now an associate professor at the KO Faculty of, of uh, Science and Technology, and our student uh, Yasuhiro Ogura came up with the subdivided phase oracle. And um, essentially what we do with that is rather than um, marking a state binary, yes or no, by flipping the phase by a factor of pi, what we do is we subdivide the circle into smaller chunks and we essentially use a um, sweep hand as a value to, uh, to track the, uh, the goodness or badness of an objective function for, for, for some sort of uh, optimization problem, for example. Um, this visualization, I wish I had the video to show you, but I don't, um, gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, if you start with a whole bunch of possible states in superposition, as in the upper left there with the, uh, the red one on top, um, each one of these states has some possible um, cost function or benefit function for this. And what we're looking for is we're looking for the ones with the largest values. So what we do is we design the system such, such that um, if you're looking at this through the uh, through the equator of the block sphere, through the uh, x y plane of the block sphere, different values result in it in uh, for the, for the cost function um, give you a a different angle rotation, and the redder the arrow is, the more it um, rotates. So you can see in the middle picture on the uh, on the top row that that the uh, the top, the, the red arrow, which is on the top of the stack in the leftmost picture, um, has rotated a full 180 degrees. It has rotated pi. Uh, this is a, a full on Z gate. But that the other less pink values and ultimately white values have moved less. Um, and then the yellow and purple arrows you see in the sequence of diagrams are part of the progression of amplitude amplification using essentially Grover's algorithm. And you can see that that the desirable era arrow, the desirable state actually grows, but that interesting things happen to the phase along the way. And so we think that's actually a, a technique with uh, quite a bit of uh, potential in the short run for, for uh, optimization problems on uh, NISC machines. So um, yeah, there's a slightly more uh, detailed uh, description of it. Let me slip over that. Um, another area in which we're doing quite a bit of work actually is in software engineering for quantum computing systems. Um, this is adapted from a, uh, a paper by some other researchers that's cited there at the bottom. On the left-hand side, you can see you know, essentially the classical software uh, life cycle where you begin with planning and design and then you implement and you test and you debug and you deploy and you maintain. And you go around the cycle and the progressively iter iterating as you go. With the quantum software, light development cycle, there are additional steps that need to go in, including um, how you're going to split a, a, a problem into the classical and quantum portions, um, how you make the the, the uh, software actually better suited to a particular hardware platform. So the hardware selection there, optimization for that, um, dealing with error mitigation. And so the fundamental ideas in quantum software engineering are exactly the same, but because the environment is rather different, in particular, you're having to deal with, with uh, noise and the limitations of resources. Um, the preferred solutions and, and the portions of the overall cycle that you have to actually concentrate on vary quite a bit. So one of the projects we're actually uh, working on is, in fact, a debugger for, for uh, quantum circuits. Um, how can we go about debugging software what are what are the kinds of errors that people actually um 
run into when they're actually developing software or, or create when, when they're developing software? How can we detect those? How can we correct them? Given that, for example, you can't have the equivalent of a classical breakpoint where you stop the execution of a program, examine the registers and examine the memory and say, this is the current state and then go on. Um, so how do you deal with that? Um, another area where we've been doing quite a bit of work is um, dealing with NISC systems and trying to take advantage of the resources that are there. So uh, this was uh, work by one of my undergraduates. This is essentially the, the undergraduate thesis of uh, Yasuhiro Okura. And it's a system for executing multiple algorithms on uh, or multiple programs on a computer, quantum computer at the same time. So you've got a set of programs that you want to execute that are sort of amenable to, to NISC um, level um, execution. So generally speaking, you know, today with 127-bit machines already available and 433-bit machines coming online, you know, you might have 10, 40 qubit sized uh, programs. And the question is, can, how can you implement, how can you execute them without having to make them all wait and giving them all control of the entire machine at a time? So you take this set and what you do is you assign them to different portions on the uh, on the chip and then you run them all at once. Right? Um, seems like a good idea, right? Challenge is that you get crosstalk, you get interference from one application to another. And so what we propose is to actually add a buffer or ring around the individual programs and that actually cuts down the the, uh, the crosstalk between them. And um, this paper has been accepted and published in uh, IEEE Transactions on Quantum Engineering. So if you're interested, by all means, uh, take a look. One of our current projects is actually on uh, graph state-based compilation. This is in cl collaboration with uh, the group of Simon uh, Devitt and uh, Zapata. Oh, and the slide says uh, this is still confidential. It's not. The work is now public. Of the uh, There is, in fact, a paper on the archive uh, uh, that, that you can look up. And so my apologies for, for what the slide there actually says. Um, the idea builds on a paper that, that's getting a huge amount of traction and has drawn a, a, drawn a lot of attention uh, within the quantum compilation community called A Game of Surface Codes, which builds on lattice surgery, which um, Dominic Horsman, uh, Austin Fowler, Simon Devitt, and I developed more than a decade ago. So this paper by Daniel Latinsky shows a good way for actually using this in, in uh, for fault-tolerant computation. So we've worked with this quite a bit. So this is the rough idea of what you're going to wind up with. You start with a, uh, a circuit on the left. And what you do is you actually have to have portions of the machine that are assigned to hold your quantum data and portions that are assigned for doing what we call distillation or reducing the, uh, the errors in logical states. So we have to build from there. And ultimately within this project, our goal is to take a graph or a graph state that represents a large scale quantum computation and map it to a set of building blocks as defined in the, in the uh, Latinsky paper. All right, um, let me take you through to some education and uh, community things that we're doing. I've already mentioned the Future Learn course. I'm gonna plug it again. Um, many thousands of people have been through that. The, the 13,000 there on, on the slide is a very old number. And I should point out that it's available in English, Japanese, Thai, and Indonesian. Um, our quantum, our overview of quantum education, overview of quantum communications course, the videos are all on uh, YouTube and they're available in both English and in Japanese. The face you see there is Mikhail Heideshek, who's a project associate professor in my group. He does the English and I do the Japanese. Um, and our videos on YouTube have been viewed uh, well over a hundred thousand times now. Um, you know, this is actually also old data. This is a uh, year old data at this point. So within that also, um, each year at IEEE Quantum Week, there has been a, uh, a quantum education workshop, which one of my students has been involved in organizing in, which I gave a talk at uh, last year. And our people have been involved as Kiskit advocates and also participating very directly in the community in that sense. So we believe in community as well as education being uh, critical things. 
and as I already mentioned, you know, I'm now the head of the editor in chief of IEEE Transactions on Quantum Engineering. So please send your papers. All right. And finally, I want to spend just a few minutes here on um, quantum communication, which is one of the areas where we're actually doing a tremendous amount of work. John Dowling likes to, co to call our current revolution um, the, the second quantum revolution, with the first one being the creation of the laser and the transistor. Right? Um, we all know that quantum computers can potentially have some effects on classical cryptography. And so one of the questions is, can quantum communications recover some of that um, uh, security, we hope, but part of what we want to do is we want to create large scale quantum networks that actually have a variety of uses. And that takes us from unentangled networks that are basically good for quantum key distribution to fully entangled networks that, that are useful for cryptography and high precision sensors and ultimately connecting quantum computers into a quantum internet. So, the work on quantum key distribution networks and on um, the uh, and on fully entangled networks. The ideas are also are roughly as old, but building the full entangled um, networks is actually a, a harder technological challenge and depends a lot on quantum memories and essentially small quantum computers. And so it's just starting to really become feasible to build the quantum repeaters that will make up that second generation of uh, of uh, quantum communication systems. And so you can see some of the, uh, you know, a prediction for some of the, uh, the milestones here. I mentioned already that we can essentially divide applications of the quantum internet into three major areas, um, distributed cryptographic functions, distributed computation and sensors. And these are some of the kinds of applications that, that might actually be developed for use on that, on that uh, quantum internet that, that we are ultimately building and some of the ones there in the in the crypto, cryptographic bubble, for example, reduce our dependency on public key infrastructure and one-way one way functions and computational complexity is the basis for some of our security. So it has you know, not just changing how big a computation we can do or how big a function we can execute, but also how those functions actually get executed. Another area that's of some interest is um, quantum sensor networks. Um, meaning including clock synchronization is a big one, but the example I'll show you here um, is the use of distributed quantum entanglement to enhance the resolution of long baseline interferometry, an idea proposed by Daniel Gottesman, uh, oh, several years ago now, um, quite a while ago now. Um, the, uh, but if we can create entanglement at a high enough rate between a set of antennas, like the antennas shown there on the right of the picture, then ideally will actually improve the resolution of long baseline interferometry. So part of what we are doing in my own group is we're, not only are we designing these networks, but we're actually simulating them and developing software to actually run on them. Um, so here's a view of uh, QUISP actually. Uh, QUISP is our quantum internet simulation package in action running um, in, the, uh, in the web browser in, the, in this particular case. Um, the code itself builds on a distributed simulation system called um, Omnet++, but the, uh, and so the code's written in C++, but it has now been engineered and compiled to run in WebAssembly and runs directly in your web browser if you want to do it that way. And um, if you want to control it using Python, you can do that using um, a, uh, you can host it on Google Collaboratory and you can actually uh, control the interface via Python for defining the networks that you actually want to simulate. That brings us to the Quantum Internet Task Force. Um, smack in the middle of this is uh, Shota Nagayama, right there where it says Hayashi. That's because Hayashi-san's picture is missing, not because that's Hayashi there. Um, the guy in the middle there is Shota Nagayama, who has led... Who, um, brought together this entire group of people from across Japan into an organization that, that he named the Quantum Internet Task Force. And we are working to build a uh, metropolitan area um, test bed for quantum internet related things um, here in the uh, Kanagawa, Yokohama, um, Tokyo area. And um, 
a big chunk of this work is actually also being funded for uh, by the government under the Japanese Moonshot Project, which uh, I talked about earlier on with the quantum multi-computer design. We're designing and building test um, interconnects for, for the large-scale quantum computers that will have to be built in that multi-computer fashion. So um, QIRT, QITF is a Japanese organization, but I'm also um, the... Uh, the chair or the co-chair with uh, Wojtek Kozlowski from uh, the Technical Technical University of Delft uh, for a group called um, the Quantum Internet Research Group, or QIRG, which is a subgroup of the Internet Research Task Force. And we meet a couple of times a year, um, either online or in person, in conjunction with um, IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, which uh, is the worldwide many thousands of people organization that designs the protocols and the operational procedures for the classical internet. In conjunction with that, IETF and IRTF actually met this past March in uh, in Yokohama, and we actually visited the laboratory of uh, Professor Ahori Kiri, who is on this uh, picture, uh, this previous picture somewhere there in the bottom uh, on the right, um, not the right most, but uh, underneath uh, Quera, quantum memory rare earth. Uh, we visited his lab. And so we had quite a number of people come and take part in that. And that was a good thing. And uh, now that we are building out our own laboratory, you know, this is what it looks like, um, you know, just as we're getting started with our, with our own um, quantum optics and quantum uh, entanglement distribution uh, network. And we are looking for students and postdocs and faculty to come join us in this. So if you're interested, by all means, let me know or Shota Nagayama, that's Shota sitting up there on the ladder in the upper left. And finally, um, our quantum communications uh, book that I mentioned earlier when I talked about the online courses, um, the material that's on YouTube has now been turned into a draft textbook, including um, exercises and things like that. Uh, Mikhail Hydrushek and I are the primary authors, but we're taking contributions from other people. And the whole thing is being released to Creative Commons. As I said, if you want to use it, great. Use it however best suits you. That will thrill us. Um, it's about 300 pages right now. It includes uh, exercises. There's still a little bit of stuff that needs to be added to it. Um, it's aimed really at second or third year undergrads um, after a first quantum information processing course, but it doesn't take a lot of uh, math background, primarily vectors and linear algebra and discrete probability and complex numbers and you're done. Here's you a, a very quick look at the set of contents of, of that. So covering um, fundamentals of optics, including waveguides and things like that, and the fundamentals of quantum repeaters and everything and repeater systems and uh, like that. So feedback in it is also very welcome, ideally via GitHub uh, pull issues or pull requests on the GitHub repository, which is open and public. All right, let me wind up here. Um, I showed you this chart earlier, right? We've gone from the earliest qubits in the lower left, and we currently sit somewhere still toward the lower left in this, in the NISC era, the, the noisy intermediate scale quantum era. And we want to get to the fault tolerant quantum multi-computer era in the upper right. And it's going to take a team, right? We want to get from the Wright brothers to the airliner. Right? Um, so question for you, going from here to there, what is your core competency? What is it that you bring to doing this? How can you help help us build these entire systems? Us meaning not just me and my group, but the entire global community of quantum people all working to build these kinds of things. What is it that you bring to the table? I hope you'll bring in and I hope you'll contribute to to our uh, to our overall global effort because it's all hands on deck. With that, I think I'm done. Um, final words. Um, go quantum native. Now I call my youngest students, uh, well, you know, all my students these days, they're learning quantum alongside learning classical computation. And in my view, that makes them quantum natives, just the same as my own kids are uh, digital natives. So um, 
train them up and I'm looking forward to, to all of them surpassing what it is that, that uh, you know, the, the, the current senior generation of re researchers, including me, what we do. I just can't wait to see what everybody else uh, coming is, is going to generate. Thank you all for your attention. And again, my apologies for not actually being in uh, Florida. I really wish I was there. I hope you have a great conference at FCRC, Sigmetrics and ISCA and, and everything else. Um, and hopefully I'll see you somewhere down the road. And if you're interested in sending, a, you know, coming and being a PhD student or a graduate student or a postdoc or joining us as faculty, let me know. Although I got to be honest, I'm really terrible about about uh, replying to email. So um, good luck on catching me and uh, try me via social media if you if you uh, if you can. But otherwise, just keep trying with the the uh, the, the email, and eventually I'll see it. Or ask somebody uh, around me to actually uh, contact me. All right. Uh, again, um, thanks for thanks for your attention. I hope the rest of the day and the rest of the week are, are great. Um, so see you all either in Japan or in the U.S. or somewhere down the road. Bye all. Stay safe.